Today we're celebrating the Feast of that Transfiguration, this uh, event in Jesus' life when he goes up the mountain and brings three of his close disciples with him, Peter, James, and John, and he is transfigured before them. What does this mean that he's transfigured before them? As we know, Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. Right? One of the things that the Lord continues to do as he's walking around and, and um, preaching and, and doing miracles is he's trying to reveal who he is. And he's pointing to the fact that he is not only right, a, a, a human being, but that he's also God. He's God made man. And so he does this to different things if, that he says and that he does. But in the transfiguration, it's like he takes off the veil of the fact that, right, the, the veil that it is hidden of his divinity, right? He, he takes these close disciples of his and he lifts the veil that they're able to see his divinity just kind of in a very palpable way, right? And so his face shines like the sun and his clothes, clothes become white as light. And Peter, James, and John kind of enter this mystical experience because they're seeing Jesus like in his divine nature in a palpable um, way. Now, one thing we could ask is why does Jesus do this? Why does Jesus kind of lift up the veil for some of his disciples? Some of the church fathers, and the church fathers are kind of like the early Christians that wrote a lot, kind of early, early, early Christians, uh, bishops and stuff that would write, about the events of Jesus' life and interpret scriptures, would say that perhaps one of the things that Jesus was doing is trying to give something to his disciples to hold on to for later on at the crucifixion. You could think maybe of two, two mountains that, that kind of are important in Jesus' life. One is the mountain of the transfiguration, and then the other one is the mountain of Calvary, right? The mountain of the transfiguration Jesus lifts off the veil of his divinity, and it's just so evident who he is, right? His disciples there almost like don't even need faith. Like they can just see who Jesus is at the transfiguration. But then there's the mountain of Calvary, where in a sense, his divinity is veiled even more than usual because he is dying, right? And the disciples that are there, especially John, who's the one that really is there, actually needs faith at that moment, right, to see the divinity of Jesus that is being concealed as he's dying on the cross. In a sense, John needs to remind himself, or his memory, of like, yeah, I remember seeing Jesus' divinity at the transfiguration. I know that he is God. And now that as, as I'm seeing my Lord crucified, and it doesn't seem like he is God, I do know, however, that he is God because he revealed that to me. So now, through the eyes of faith, right, John can see that Jesus, still divine, is the same man who was there at the transfiguration, even though Jesus' divinity is being concealed as he is dying there on the cross. Perhaps something similar happens to us in our life. You know, we have moments where we kind of experience that transfiguration in a sense, where the, the reality of who God is, His love for us, right? How He provides for us, His providence, His presence, His support, His comfort, His strength, is very palpable. Perhaps it's so palpable that it's almost like we don't even need faith. Like we just see with clarity, like this is who God is. And I experience Him, and it's just so easy, right, to see who the Lord truly is. Moments of transfiguration in our life. Then there's also perhaps moments where that is concealed from us, moments of crucifixion, of Calvary, where, yes, I mean, God doesn't change. He is the same, but somehow uh, he's a little bit more concealed. It's hard to understand what it is that the Lord is doing. And like John there at the foot of the cross. And in those moments, right, we really do need faith. Being a Christian actually demands faith. Our, our faith actually demands a faith, a certain leap, a certain trust, a certain conviction of things that are not seen all the time, right? 
This is what faith is. And our faith, uh, and when we have to exercise right, these acts of faith, it actually unites us to the Lord in a deep way. John on the cross says that it is in our faith that the Lord espouses us, right? The things are not as clear, and yet we, have an, we, we make an act of faith of believing who the Lord is, perhaps remembering other times where, where we have seen this clearly. As we make these acts of faith and we persevere in our belief, the Lord espouses us. A greater intimacy is had with him. And, and I think the Lord really does this, he invites us to trust him and to make, act, make acts of faith precisely to draw us closer to himself, to have a deeper relationship, deeper friendship. Maybe a little bit of a dumb example that comes to mind. Uh, sometimes in movies, and this happens in a lot of movies, I don't know why. You know, there's the good guys and the bad guys, whatever the theme of the movie is. And the good guys are trying to beat the bad guys. And at some point, the good guys, towards the end of the movie, they're trying to really, you know, win the final battle or whatever. And one of the good guys says to one of the other good guys, hey, do you trust me? And, you know, the person replies, yes, I trust you. And so then they, they do something really weird that you would think, why is this person doing this? Then ultimately, it actually leads to the good guys, you know, winning and the bad guys, you know, losing, whatever, right? This sense of, and asking of a trust, do you trust me? And then something happens that kind of makes no sense, but ultimately leads to something good. And I think the Lord perhaps often invites us to this sort of trust in Him. Hey, do you trust me? And then we say, yes, Lord, I trust you. And then maybe He does something or allows something to happen that we don't completely understand, right? But... He continues to have our best interest in mind because he loves us and he can make everything turn out for good for those who love him. I've been mean, reading this book called uh, Priestly Fatherhood. So it's kind of more for priests, so you may not want to read it. But there's something uh, that, that the author said that I kind of like that I want to share with you. He says, our worst sin is not our human weaknesses or miseries. God knows very well how to make use of, use of them. But our lack of faith in the fidelity and power of God. Our worst sin is not our human weaknesses or miseries. God knows very well how to make use of them. But our lack of faith in the fidelity and power of God. But our faith is the very foundation of our relationship with the Lord, right? Our, it's important that we try not to sin, but just the faith that we have in Him even goes before that. And if you think about kind of the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve, right? How, do, how is it that Adam and Eve fall? They, they fall into this trap that the serpent is tempting, the, tempting them with of not trusting the Lord. Hey, God actually doesn't have your best interest in mind. You should doubt him. This fruit, actually, he's trying to keep something from you. You should eat it, right? So at the very kind of outset of the, the, the fall, original sin, there's this mistrust of God, that God is really not a loving father. And we have this wound constantly, right, of falling into this trap of thinking that he's not a loving father when he is. You're his son, you're his daughter, and he loves you. He does invite us. Sometimes he gives us clarity of his presence. Sometimes he invites us to trust him when things are not as clear, when things perhaps do not make as much sense. So if you find yourself, either now or maybe in the near future, in a time where uh, maybe things are not as clear and it's not as easy for you to see the Lord's presence or divinity, what can you do? And say so you can pray, and specifically, I say you can, you can make acts of faith. What does an act of faith look like? It's just like a short prayer where you're kind of surrendering to the Lord and putting your faith in Him. So, for example, uh, an act of faith that I like to do sometimes is the one that we have here in our um, Divine Mercy image. It says right there, Jesus, I trust in you. You can repeat the, the awesome thing about such a small prayer like that 
is that you can just say it throughout the day. Be driving, you can be at work, right? You can be, you know, washing dishes, doing whatever. You can just repeat that over and over again. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you, right? Trying to surrender, right, and put your faith in him. And oftentimes when we do this, we actually receive a lot of, a lot of peace, right? We are spouse with the Lord. We receive deeper intimacy with him, and we receive peace because we're surrendering to his will and knowing that he has our best interest, uh, you know, at hand. Another two, two prayers that I'll give to you, there's plenty, but one is that Jesus, I trust in you, one. Another one that I like is from the Holy Scriptures, uh, uh, this, this person that tells Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Beautiful prayer where we say, yes, Lord, I have faith and I trust you and I believe, but I also lack faith. Help my unbelief. And again, it's something that you can repeat over and over again throughout the day. And the last one that I, I suggest to you, but again, there's plenty more, is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. And again, it's something that we can say over and over again, uh, surrendering uh, to the Lord.